talk a little bit more about what's next, Sean. I mean, it seems like the momentum has stalled pretty early on. Was that the right move from South Korea to actually bring up the issue of denuclearization on the first round of talks? Well, I guess they felt they had to, but they can't be surprised by the response because North Korea has made it clear that they're not giving up their nukes. And in fact, they can't. So uh, the North Korean response is exactly what I would have expected. So balls in whose court now, Sean? Uh, I think it's in South Korea's court to walk away. Uh, you know, intellectually, we can't argue with the talks because we've always told Pyongyang that the road to Washington runs through Seoul, that we can't talk to them until they at least talk to our ally. But now we're in danger of South Korea, who's so desperate for some kind of rapprochement, just funding the regime, which is just going to increase the nukes and missile tests. You know, it's bad enough they're coming to the Olympics. Now I hear that South Korea is paying for it. I mean, why don't they pay for a few rockets while they're at it? As I see it, we're just funding the enemy. It brings a lot of questions about the red lines. I guess there has been some uncertainty on what President Moon's red lines are and how they align with President Trump. But how do you see how he deals with these talks and how is it different from some of the liberal predecessors, as you mentioned, who historically have been pretty soft when it comes to these negotiations with Pyongyang? Yeah, well, you know, we've had uh, sunshine in the past, and it seems like moonshine is a little tougher than sunshine, because while he is a liberal, which is a Korean nationalist by nature and wants to reach out to the North, he is ex-special forces and seems to be a lot tougher than his two liberal predecessors and has stood pretty closely to the United States. Also, the South Korean public is a lot tougher on the North than it was 10 or 15 years ago. So I don't think he's going to roll over for the North like his two liberal predecessors did, but he's obviously not going to be as tough as either Park Geun-hye or Im Myung Bak, his two uh, conservative predecessors, were. But are you so? Are you disappointed with how these talks came uh, came out? Yes, definitely. Uh, I didn't expect so soon that they'd be willing to send goodies to the north just for them to smile and send two ice skaters to Pyeongchang. But aren't they in a tough position, right? I mean, they're walking a very, very tight line here. What are they afraid that North Korea is going to attack them if they don't go to the Olympics? I mean, they're just they're kicking the can down the road. They're just giving more money to the regime that has them under their gun. I mean, pay them now or pay them later. Uh, I guess they see having a North Korean... What about diplomacy, though, Sean, right? Uh, I'm all for diplomacy, but diplomacy at what end? I think we should talk to them, but just giving them money before there are any concessions on the other side, that doesn't sound like diplomacy. That sounds like a one-way street. And I know that Moon has an incentive for North Koreans to be at the Olympics, to use them as human shields, thinking that there won't be any kind of attack. Remember, the last time Korea hosted Olympics in 1988, North Korea blew up a Korean airliner in 1987 to scare people away. Uh, they may do some kind of provocation on the border, but the idea that they would attack the games themselves 70 miles in from the DMZ was far-fetched to so, begin with. So in your view then, so, uh, so uh, Kim Jong-un's overture on New Year's Day, uh, you think it's a complete, uh, complete farce? There's no, there's no genuine meaning behind that. Uh, I think that, well, first of all, I can't get inside the head of Kim Jong-un. Uh, no, nobody can. I don't even understand what's going on in this country, let alone North Korea. Right. I thought it was a big climb down for North Korea. You know, for, uh, since May, North Korea had refused to engage the South because they consider themselves a legitimate government for all Korea, and the South is but a foreign-controlled colonial puppet. So by us refusing to engage the North and tightening the sanctions, North Korea blinked and reached out to the South. So that was positive. It's the things that they've been discussing since and that worry me, but the talks themselves don't bother me at all.